convinced Quaker, but I am also a member of the International Institute for Strategic Studies. Turns out there is one other Quaker who's a member of the IISS. Um, last I heard of him, he was serving in the Green Zone in Baghdad, but we uh, talk to each other um, from time to time. If the if our government attacks Iran, the retribution, the, retali the military retaliation would come against American positions, forces, bases, and supply lines in Iran, Iraq and the Gulf, as I mentioned. And the whole of the Straits of Hormuz, the uh, international oil lifeline, would be in extreme jeopardy. We think we've seen the oil shock so far. We haven't seen anything compared with what would happen if there were a war in the Gulf. I've actually come to the conclusion that all foreign wars are unwinnable in the 21st century. And I, I, can, I can discuss that. I've discussed it on my blog a little bit, um, Just World News, if you want to go to it. And I need to write more about it. But this certainly is a foreign war that is unwinnable. And the people in the Pentagon have war-gamed this out a number of times. And every time they do it, it looks as though this attack on Iran would end up being disastrous for Iran, certainly. But it would be even worse for the US military in the Gulf. That Iran would survive, but the, it would be catastrophic for the US military supply lines and positions and bases in Iraq and the Gulf. So we're talking about something very serious. We're talking about something so serious that it is, it's extremely painful to me to think that our members of Congress are just blithely signing on to all this legislation without really thinking about their constituents who are there with their lives on the line. I just want to put in a little word about the role of Israel in all this because it's very hard to mention the, the whole question of Iran and nuclear weapons without recognizing Israel's role. There is a very powerful pro-Israeli lobby in this country that is concentrated in an organization called APAC, the America-Israel Public Affairs Committee. APAC has been going for a long time and has, a, has had a lot of uh, great political successes. It's had some setbacks recently. Some of its people were arrested um, on charges of, of um, aiding foreign powers. That would be Israel. Um, but they are still extremely powerful, especially in Congress. On their website, they have five action items, five buttons that you go to, you know, if you want to, like, take a pro-APAC action. Three of them concern ratcheting up the pressure on Iran. This pressure that's, that our members of Congress are being subjected to is not coming from nowhere. That is one of the prime locations that it's coming from. And it really pains me to think how many people blithely give their support to APAC without understanding what APAC is doing in terms of ratcheting up these tensions toward war. It's true that Israelis and everybody in the region has reason to be concerned if, if Iran has a nuclear weapons program, although we were told in the NIE last November, as Kara mentioned, that they dismantled their nuclear weapons program some years ago, they are continuing with their nuclear technology program, but without any evidence that it is being diverted into a nuclear weapons program. So it's true that Israel has reason to be concerned. But guess what? Israel has its own nuclear weapons capability and is quite capable of using de deterrence of all forms against Iran. Iran is quite deterrable. So you know, what the Israelis, what many Israelis are aiming to do is to keep their nuclear monopoly in the Middle East. There are Israelis who say it, it's okay, it, it really doesn't affect their basic security if Iran gets nuclear weapons. People like former spy chief Ephraim Halevi say, you know, so what if they get it, you know, we've, we've got it. Like it, then it's a mutual deterrence thing, like between the US and the Soviet Union. 
um, back in the day of the Cold War. So it's just some Israelis are very um, motivated and act, acting hard on this, and some Israelis are not. So let's move quickly to the question of negotiations. What needs to be negotiated between our country and Iran? How could negotiations occur? Kara was quite right to note that there are many shared interests between our country and Iran. In Iraq, but also in Afghanistan, and we need to recognize that when um, our military actually dismantled, just demolished the Taliban regime in 2001, it did so with considerable help from the Iranians, who have been opposed to the Taliban much more consistently than our country has been, and who share a lot of strong interests in Afghanistan, which is coming to be the more important theater of fighting, as well as in Iraq. So there are shared interests, but our country and other countries have some very serious concerns about Iran. I don't want to say there are no concerns, but guess what? The Iranians have concerns about our government's actions, too. So what we need to do is to have some kind of a negotiation, whether it is bilateral negotiation, face-to-face, sort of like when Nixon and Kissinger went to China back in the day and had this remarkable negotiation in which so many issues, I mean, I can, you know, I was pretty young then, but I gather in the 1950s there was all this thing about the yellow peril and, you know, a lot of fear-mongering in this country and everybody thought the Chinese were about to do X, Y, or Z. And Nixon and Kissinger defused the whole thing and put the Chinese-U.S. relationship back onto this remarkable course that we have seen ever since the 1970s. So it could be a bilateral negotiation in which a visionary U.S. You know, it's kind of uh, hard to think of Nixon as a visionary, but in that regard, he truly was. Um, and maybe, you know, for kind of very manipulative political reasons, but we needn't go into people's motivations. Let's look at their actions. That was a visionary action. So we could have the same kind of a, a, a visionary American president who would respond to the many overtures, to the next one, let's say, of the many overtures that the Iranian regime has sent out to, to Washington, respond positively. And there could be what's called a grand bargain between the two sides. Or it could be a UN-sponsored negotiation that perhaps would be entered into via a negotiation over Iraq, because the situation in Iraq is one that cries out for cooperation between the two countries. So here are the concerns, how I define the concerns that our country has about Iran. There are those related to its actions in Iraq. There are those related to its nuclear um, technology program. There are those related to its threats against Israel and to the extremely hateful rhetoric that the president of Iran has voiced against Israel. There are concerns related to the balance of power in, in the Persian Gulf area and the whole of the Middle East. And now how about their concerns about us, 